Some of you already know that my first job right out of college was as a middle school science teacher in Houston, Texas. I was 21 years old. I was a bright-eyed idealist. And back then, I did not even need coffee to make it through my morning. I'm already on cup number two today. There were a lot of things I could tell you about that experience. If you find me at lunch or at happy hour, I'll share a story, or two, or 10 if you're lucky. But the quick version of, the, the quick version of it is this. It was amazing, and it was the toughest thing I've ever done. The school where I worked was, to put it very mildly, dysfunctional. And it was embedded within a dysfunctional regional school system. And it was embedded within a dysfunctional national school system. I'll let you Americans think about that for a second. There were many days that I went home elated. To be entrusted with that level of responsibility at that age, to feel like you were making a tangible impact on something important, something bigger than you every day. I don't know how many people get to say that for as long as I did, and I will always be profoundly grateful for that experience. And there were many nights I went home crying, and there were days that I escaped to the faculty bathroom to cry by myself there, too. Um, a mentor of mine once said, Kara, part of this experience is that you should feel rage. You should feel rage at a system that results in some people having an appalling lack of opportunities and resources. You should feel rage at a system that doesn't just perpetuate inequality, but is arguably designed for inequality. I taught for four years, and I worked in education for another eight before coming to Saeed. That rage that I felt as a 21-year-old is still here. Some of you have seen it in class. It's, <laughs> it's, it's more of a slow boil now, but that feeling in my gut is actually what led me out of the classroom and what led me to Saeed. Many of my friends and colleagues said, Kara, why are you applying to business school? Many of you here have looked me in the eye and said, Kara, why are you in business school? <laughs> um, and there's nobody that has asked this question more than I've asked it of myself. Kara, why are you here? So at this point, I've worked for a number of years in a number of contexts, and I kept coming back to the same thing again and again and again, that the sort of change that needs to happen to fundamentally improve anything at scale will never happen without the money, connections, or power of the business community. So what really excites me about this weekend is that I believe that as a business community, we are at a crossroads in regards to our collective power and responsibility. As someone who often worked on the receiving end of companies and organizations that wanted to do good, I've seen money and resources wielded in strange and frankly unhelpful ways. For example, a big bank in New York City wanted our office to find them a school so that in the middle of the day, hordes of their employees could go in and reach to students. There's a big international foundation. You all know and love them. I know and love them too, but they have required hours of time and an inordinate amount of patience to convince them that actually, the local program you've proposed for a small sum of money has the potential for bigger and more sustained impact than a multi-million dollar political awareness campaign. So I don't want to diminish the role of foundations in CSR because they do have a role to play. But we collectively cannot continue to rely on them and think that they are enough to fix problems and systems at scale. They are not. So the question then becomes, how do we fundamentally embed this sense of responsible leadership into the core of our everyday work? Not as an afterthought, not because it makes us feel good, not as a reaction, and not because it's politically expedient but because we benefit when we embed this ethos of responsible business directly into our work. The mindset shift that I think is happening, that, that I hope is happening, is that more than believing this kind of mindset benefits us as a society, more and more people believe that it actually benefits the bottom line of a business. This is our communal responsibility. I talk a lot about education and people because it's what I know best, but it's only a reference point for the very many changes that I hope that we'll see in our lifetime. We all have a story and a specific motivation that will drive us. Maybe for you, it's about building an equitable and sustainable supply chain. Maybe for you, it's about reducing your company's environmental footprint. It's going to be different for all of us, and that is the whole point. That if we all considered these things starting now, not just when we're in positions of leadership, that it would fundamentally shift the way we do business, and it would fundamentally shift the outcomes. Evan and Sonia and others throughout the day will ground this idea of responsible business in examples of quantifiable impact. You'll have the chance to consider it through a macro lens, and you'll have the chance to consider it through a micro lens. 
throughout the day, and I hope indefinitely we'll each continue to ask ourselves the following questions. What do I believe needs to be fundamentally different? What exactly will need to happen in the everyday to create that change? What am I going to do about it? And who are the people that are going to help me do this? I think our challenge as a community is radically adjusting our short-term actions in service of a much longer-term vision. So I know at least a few of you in this room saw Secretary of State John Kerry. Hands up. Anybody see them? Anybody see him? I was blown away by two things. One was his hair. It's fantastic. You should look at a photo of him. Um, but other than that, there is only one thing I wrote down during his speech, and I kept coming back to it in light of what we were talking about this weekend. So I'm going to leave you with Secretary of State John Kerry's words and not mine. The problems of today will pale in comparison to what's coming down the road, but we don't have to wait for this to happen. Thank you. Hi. The discussion whether an individual in an organization should be concerned solely with their own welfare or should take into consideration the welfare of others has been debated for literally thousands of years. There are references to it in every major religious text. Plato and Aristotle debated it extensively. Xenophon, the first written economist, put forward concepts of organizations and social welfare more than 2,000 years before Adam Smith, well before Milton Friedman. While the debate continues, we live in a time where the conversation is more salient than ever before. Economic systems and businesses are simultaneously the most beneficial and harmful forces in the world, providing opportunity for billions of people, but also causing significant social and environmental degradation. The notion of a responsible business is no longer a discussion of competitive advantage, a means to attract customers, a strategy to do costs. It is a discussion of how we reconcile the beneficial and harmful aspects of business so that we can maintain a livable planet for ourselves and for future generations. Is there any more important exploration than this? To begin, I would like to make one contentious statement. Thank you. The phrase doing good and doing well, which has proliferated in recent years, I believe is an imperfect way to frame this issue. Doing good and doing well is not necessarily synonymous with responsible business. It implies that only actions that have positive social value and that also contribute to the bottom line are worthwhile undertakings. Several years ago in CSR departments, the notion was that corporate social responsibility should not be overtly about making money. Now the pendulum has shifted, and social good activities, by and large, always need to be connected to the bottom line. Unfortunately, the reality is that what is right is not always what is most profitable. The statement of doing good and doing well has also been taken to imply that the best way to address the challenges we face as a society are through market mechanisms. I believe this to be categorically untrue. There are certainly many challenges that business provides an excellent mechanism to solve. However, doing good and doing well would not adequately address the systemic and complicated challenges we face. Only with business, civil society, governments, and philanthropic organizations working in collaboration can we address our challenges. The important thing, I believe, is not for an organization to do good, but quite simply to be good. As such, the idea of a responsible business is not necessarily synonymous with doing good and doing well. A responsible business, quite simply, is one that is good through and through. So how does one intentionally create a responsible business? How is it measured? Fundamentally, a responsible business needs to be guided by a defining set of principles and values. These values need to infuse all aspects of the organization, be clearly communicated, and have support at every level of management and staff. Too often, companies put forward their values as platitudes, but they do not take the necessary corrective actions when the rhetoric does not match their actions. 
especially when the action is inconvenient or costly. Honesty, ongoing reflection, and feedback from management and all employees is paramount to make sure intentions line up with actions. These values should inform the economic and financial principles by which an organization operates. This is the most challenging aspect because it is quite dependent upon external factors. It is common for corporate leaders to lament the short-term perspectives forced upon them by the stock market. They feel constrained to make decisions that are not in the long-term interest of their companies, let alone society at large. Corporate leaders are beginning to take a hard stance against the focus on short-term gains, but decisions by and large are still not viewed with long-term time horizons. Socially responsible investing and impact investing are working to address short-sighted and instructive investment, but they do not provide a panacea. The capital structures of companies can be a severely limiting factor for truly responsible business, and we must work diligently to address this issue. Next, at the top, there are operations of the businesses and the products that are sold. One of the clearest indicators of a responsible business is how directly aligned their core products are with the social good the company says they provide. In other words, the way the company makes money should ideally be directly correlated with their social good. Oftentimes, companies point to the secondary indicators, such as the jobs they create in underserved communities, as evidence of social good. While the benefits of jobs is certainly valid, the metric is agnostic to the type of product or service provided. A company that sells cigarettes in urban slums can create jobs just as effectively as one that sells healthy food. Furthermore, it is important for a responsible business to understand and measure any negative unintended consequences of their actions. Because in every situation, in addition to the positive benefits, there will inevitably be repercussions. A few examples may include disrupting local businesses that can no longer compete, increasing health concerns through introducing more processed foods, or making profits from poor populations and thereby transferring money from poor to rich countries. Organizations such as the Sustainability Accounting Standards Boards are working to put sustainability metrics into accounting standards. Legal structures such as the For-Profit Benefit Corporation enable social and environmental concerns to be written into the bylaws of a company. Many socially responsible investors are working to create financial products that are better suited for responsible businesses. Thought leaders and protect practitioners are developing new and more holistic perspectives on economics that work for people and planet. Industry leaders are recognizing and integrating positive values and ethics into the DNA of their organizations. These preliminary steps create the infrastructure for responsible businesses. They are still in their infancy, but their growth portends a monumental shift that will play out over the coming decades. The perspective of a business has historically been how it can better sell its products, provide value to its customers, reduce its costs, and give a good return to its investors. However, this is not the same perspective as the customers they serve. Most people, especially in the younger generation, do not particularly care how your business performs. They care about the myriad of issues they see facing themselves, their loved ones, and the planet. They care about outcomes. They care about results. A responsible business fundamentally needs to focus more broadly on their role in society, have an understanding and genuine care for their impact on the world, and to intentionally contribute to the outcomes that we care about and need for there to be a vibrant economy and planet for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Clara and Evan. 12 months ago, many of the MBA class attacked the entrance essay question, addressing Milton Friedman's famous comment on the responsibility of the corporation, which I'm sure you all know. The business of doing business is business. Some thought while this remained fundamentally true, suggested it was the very nature of business that had changed and broadened to include community stakeholders. Others indicated the importance of social responsibility within the corporate mandate. We recently conducted a survey with the current MBA cohort to understand what some of the most pressing social challenges are and what the responsible business of the 21st century should try and tackle. 
Overwhelmingly, the MBAs indicated the environment and climate change as some of the most critical issues facing business today. The threat of climate change to the global economy has come to the fore in the past few years, with various reports from government and business leaders estimating the damage from natural disasters and rising sea levels to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Economic modelling has shown that climate change could cut the value of the world's financial assets by $2.5 trillion. That's $2.5 trillion. Worst case scenarios show this could be up to 17% of the world's assets and totally wreck the global economy. In fact, in the long term, investors would be actually better off in the low carbon world. And many pension funds are now looking to adapt this into their investment rationales. Whilst the challenge of global warming is great, so too is the market opportunity. With the climate change sector in the US alone worth $300 billion, this is equivalent to the GDP in Singapore. Companies around the globe are beginning to identify how they can apply their core business to helping solve climate change, whilst at the same time making a profit. For example, Microsoft has now introduced an internal price on carbon, and Walmart has achieved cost savings of over $1 billion each financial year by reducing the carbon footprint across its supply chain. In addition to climate change, the MBA class voiced voice growing problem of inequality across both the developed and the developing world. To put the current state of global inequality in perspective, European cows are better off than half of the world's population. Yes, I said cows. The average European cow receives $2.20 in the form of taxpayer subsidies, compared to just the $2 a day that over 3 billion people in the world live on each day. This is shocking. And the facts of global inequality are truly staggering. The assets of the world's three richest men is greater than the combined income of the world's least developed countries. Sierra Leone, ranked at the bottom of the United Nations Human Development Index, has an average income of only $130 per year per person. This is far less than the $1 a day that the World Bank suggests as subsistence level. The impact of such extreme poverty is devastating. So what can responsible business do about this? As Kara and Evan spoke about, there is a significant untapped market opportunity to reduce income inequality by including the poor in value change, cha chains as producers, consumers, and employees. In fact, climate change has had the sole biggest impact on poverty, lifting over a billion people up out of the market over the last 30 years alone. Companies who are able to use their core competency to address the various social ills contributing to inequality are beginning to move the needle, as well as recognizing new business opportunities. M-Pesa, a mobile money solution founded in Kenya, has reduced the transac uh, transaction costs of the poor by up to 68%, achieving $350 million in revenue per month. We then ask students about what business needs to do to be successful, profitable, and responsible. MBA spoke of the need to flip the relationship between business and society from one of animosity and an almost adversarial nature to one which fosters value creation over value appropriation. The MBA cohort also indicated an inability to overcome short-termism, as well as inappropriate metrics used to measure success, constraining the ability of business to act responsibly. Short-termism constrains the ambition of business, it holds back its economic growth, and it inhibits its ability to pursue profit with a far greater purpose. The UK government has provided a number of recommendations which might curb chronic short-termism in capital markets, including tapering capital gains taxes on shares, and also looking at executive pay packets and creating a 30% proportion based on long-term profits. Consumer understanding, and perhaps our very own understanding of the profit potential inherent within the profit motive is only yet embryonic. The press can play a vital role in helping us thrive understanding both within and outside companies on the role business and markets can play in being a force for good. As Kara spoke about, it is also our responsibility as business leaders to drive education on what responsible business means. How do we convey this not just to shareholders focused on earnings announcements, but how do we also engage our customers in our very sense of purpose? The role of business in society is an exciting new intersection, as Evan spoke about, 
that is rapidly moving beyond the confines of CSR to exploit new market opportunities that can deliver social good much more efficiently and much more cheaply than either government or charity could ever hope. It is going to be you, our responsible business leaders, current and future, who shape this growing space to have a tremendous impact, not just on your company, but on the broader community and how we view the business of business. Thank you.